Good morning, New Life Church. So James said, God made you special. Some of you guys I heard say, made you special more than others. Super special. Um, extra special, yes. Y'all, I'm so excited to be up here today. Y'all, I finally, finally, finally got my voice back. Uh, <laughs> For, for some of you that don't know, well, I have not really had a voice since before Easter. Uh, it's been a struggle. During this season, I learned a couple things. First and maybe most important is those menthol cough drops, like the heavy-duty ones. Apparently, those are really bad for laryngitis. Dude, I've been sucking on them like candy. Uh, if you were ever in the church in the last month and you're walking around, you're like, smells like Vicks. That was me. I'm sorry. Um, also, I think God wanted to deal with me with some other things. I think one of the other lessons I learned was to sit down and shut up. Uh, Y'all, this, this was a hard season, though, for me, if I'm being completely honest. It was really difficult. Um, for some of you guys, like... That's, it, it, you might not think about how difficult it was, but, but talking is about 80% of what I do here. So I felt like I haven't been really able to do my job in like a month. And for some of you guys, like, hey, that sounds like a vacation. Maybe for the first week it did, but after that it got old. Y'all, like, it affected me in ways that I didn't even realize. It affected my relationships. Like, I wasn't able to have a conversation with my wife for like a month. We're sitting on the couch, and she's asking me questions, and she's talking, and I'm like texting her back an answer. And she'd say something to me about like, 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 y'all, that gets old fast. Y'all, like, um, like I, I, I had a moment at Collide Camp last week, which was super awesome, uh, where I was able to sing in worship for the first time in a month. And, like, I didn't even realize how much that would affect me, but, like, it was so big, good for my soul. Look, the Bible says just make a joyful noise. I couldn't make a joyful noise. I could just make a sad whimper. Like, I was just mouthing the words here. But when I was actually able to sing, I probably sounded worse than normal, but I didn't care. No, like, my kids, my kids are so glad I got my voice back. Like, here's, here's the thing about me, first of all. Okay, y'all got to understand, Jesus is working on me with this. Um, I get frustrated when I have to repeat myself. Parents in the house, y'all know what I'm talking about. Like, I'd say something, when I say something to my kids, like, I'm not, like, quick to, 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 to get frustrated, but it escalates super quick. Like, I'll say something to them, my kids are like, what? Or that frustration starts to build, but it's, like, way down here. I'm like, okay, okay, I'm just going to say it again. I'll say it, and they're like, what? I'm like, boom, all of a sudden, it's right up here. I'm like, did you not? Like, y'all, I had to repeat everything like 12 times. I'm trying to get the kids out the door for school. I'm like, get in the car. They're like, what? I'm like, go get in the car. Oh, that was a challenge. <laughs> but y'all, we're, I'm glad it's back, man. It was a hard season. I learned some things. Um, but I'm glad to be up here. Hey, we're continuing this series like James said. We're going to jump right in. So if you would, open up your Bibles. If you got them to Luke uh, chapter, or sorry, not Luke, John chapter 17. Um, it'll be on the screen here in a minute when we get there. But I just want to kind of set the stage what's happening here. John 17 is all Jesus praying. The whole chapter. That's just what he's doing here. And uh, he starts out just kind of get the idea. This is... Uh, after the Last Supper. Like, this is literally right before they go to the garden. They're like, okay, amen, let's go. Um, and, and Jesus, the first thing he does in this prayer, he prays for three things, but the very first thing he prays for is himself. He prays that God will glorify him, not for his sake, so he in turn can go and glorify the Father. The second thing he prays for is his disciples, he prays for the 12, well, really 11, because at this point, Judas has done dipped out already. And he prays this for them. He, he, he says, he prays that the Father would be with them, not to take them out of the world, but to protect them from the evil one in it. He says they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. You know, this is where we actually, one of the places where we get the, the, the saying that we love to throw around all the time, you know, being in the world but not of the world. 
And uh, I'm going to talk more about that later. But that is actually what I've called the message today, if anybody cares. Uh, it's called, Not of This World. So Jesus has prayed for himself. He's prayed for his disciples. And the third thing he prays for is really what I want to focus on today. He prays for all of the believers. Anyone who follows him, that means you. Turn to your neighbor and say, that means you. So we're going to be focusing on this prayer. Specifically, I want to look at verses 24 through 26. So let's check it out. He says, Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. Can we pray? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this. that has been on my heart for, for so long, Father. I just pray that you help me to get the words out the way that you want them to come out. Father, I pray that they are received uh, with open ears. Father, I pray that every single person in this room, Father, has, uh, if they haven't already, has a mindset shift. That they start to see things the way that you see things, not the way the world sees things, not the way they want to see things, but, Father, the way that you have, the way that you say it is. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. So this prayer was a big deal for Jesus. This is an important prayer, a prayer that we really, I really think we should pay attention to. Look, I don't think we should take any of Jesus' prayers lightly, but this one was especially important. This was the last time that he was with his disciples. This was the night that he was arrested. And I think about it from the idea of like a soldier on the battlefield. Like it's the calm before the storm. The battle's coming. He knows he's probably not going to make it out of it. So he pulls out pen and paper and he starts writing home. Whatever's in that letter is going to be super important to him. Jesus didn't think there was a chance he wasn't going to make it. He knew what was about to happen. So this moment, this prayer, that's super important to him. And what does he pray for us? He prays that I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am. So what does that mean? What is he praying for? What is he asking God for? And um, this is where I've been, honestly, just this month, as I've really been kind of wrestling with some stuff and dealing with some stuff, like, and I had two big takeaways during this time. Like, I read this verse, and like, immediately, right off the bat, like, God showed me, like, two different things. And then it was like last week I was doing a completely unrelated study and um, had nothing to do with this. But I saw this verse in this Bible, and they're like, it's like, God's like, this is the missing piece, which is really good because, as we all know, all sermons have to have three points, and I only had two. Whew. Um, dodge the bullet. Okay. But, but we, we hear this, we hear what Jesus is saying here, and often I think we just really overlook it. We're like, yeah, I want to be with Jesus. That sounds awesome. He's Lord. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah. The Bible says that he is seated at the right hand of God like I want to be there. But that's not what Jesus is saying. This isn't Jesus in heaven saying that I wish that everybody would be with me where I am. This was Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. On the night that he would go into the garden and be so overwhelmed with stress that he sweat blood. And he's saying, I wish that every believer, everybody who professes the name of Christ as Lord would be with me right here. That changes everything. So we're going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about what it was that Jesus was actually praying, what it is that he actually wanted for us. And the first thing I think is this right here. Jesus wants you to be in communion with God. Jesus wants you to be in communion with God. 
So I want to talk about specifically the night. I want to talk about when he goes to the garden. And I had the wrong idea what the garden was for a long, long time. Like, I thought that the garden was just this random spot that he stopped to pray. Like, he's on his way, like, hey, we got to find a place to pray. Uh, Look, a garden. Like, I I, I had this weird idea. That's what it was. You know, we call it the garden. Sometimes you'll see it say the Mount of Olives. Sometimes you'll see the Garden of Gethsemane. Really what it is, the garden was at the foot, the base of the Mount of Olives. And uh, for those that don't know, the word Gethsemane actually means oil press. And I had heard it said that the reason it was called the Garden of Gethsemane was because of the great crushing that Jesus went through in the garden. But that's not it at all. The reason it was called the Garden of Gethsemane was because of the oil press. For the olives, at the Mount of Olives. Like, we don't have to, like, hyper-spiritualize everything. There was an oil press. It was called the Garden of Gethsemane because of the oil press. And this mindset change was so different that it was called the Garden of Gethsemane because of the oil press and not because of what Jesus went through. Because it helped me to realize that this garden was more than just the place of great crushing. This garden is where Jesus went to spend time with God. And not just once. This wasn't a one-time deal. It wasn't like a flat tire. Like, I get this idea that that's what it was. Like, you're driving on the road, you get a flat tire. You're like, oh, i got to find a place to stop. It's got to meet the right conditions, you know. It's got to be well lit if it's dark. It's got to be flat ground. Because if it's not flat ground, you can't jack the tire up on the hill. Like, you got to find someplace quick. Otherwise, you're going to ruin the rim. Has anybody ever done that? Been there, done that. It's like 17 in my dad's minivan. I impressed all the ladies. Uh, but I was at my friend's house, and uh, I looked, I had a flat tire, and I'm like, I don't want to deal with this now. I'll just drive home. It's only about a mile and a half away. I'll take the back roads. By the way, speed bumps were a killer. <laughs> my dad was not happy. But this wasn't how the garden was. Like I said, this was Jesus' place. And we see this. Uh, Look, he was in Jerusalem for the week for Passover. This was the tradition. He was quite possibly there every day, maybe even multiple times a day. Luke 22 says this, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him as usual. So, uh, and this was his common practice. Jesus often went out to pray. We see this uh, in the early in the morning, he'd go out and pray. Right after he'd done teaching, he'd go up on a mountain and pray. The place in Luke talks about how he has a certain place that he went to to pray. Like, this was his practice. This is what he did. He found time to get away from the busyness of his schedule, the craziness of his ministry, all the noise, all the stuff like that, just to be in communion with his father. You know, we're actually doing a book study that talks about this with some of my leaders from our our youth ministries. And um, one of them pointed, I think it was Michaela, talked about that this was the place where Judas led the people to arrest Jesus. Like Judas knew he was going to be there. They didn't have to go looking for him. He knew he was going to be because this was his place, which makes that betrayal sting that much more. He literally brought these people to Jesus' quiet place. So we often think of the garden, like I said, this place of great suffering. But really what it was was a place of great communion with God and a place of suffering. God wants you to be in communion with him. Jesus was praying that every single one of us would have that same time, be in that same place where it's just him and God. Why? Why is that important? Because time spent in the presence of the Lord changes us. Look, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, He says, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Veil is talking about something with Moses. They would hide his face so they wouldn't see the presence of God uh, from the people. 
But it says, for the Lord is the spirit, and whatever, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory, which is like exactly what Jesus prayed for himself. The, reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Time spent with God changes us. It makes us more and more like him. I always tell people, you are an average of the five closest people in your life. Uh, my wife says it like this. You know, she's a therapist. So the, I guess the psychology term, correct me if I'm wrong, Kelly, is those who fire together, wire together. Firing like firing neurons. To me, that sounds like a bad police slogan. Like, you do the time, you do the crime. But, I, like, but it's good. It's good, though. I love it. Uh, but look, if we are the average of the five closest people in our life, God better be one of them. Really, as Christians, look, if we are called to live different, then we are called to look different. How do we look different? By spending time with God. Go and find your garden. Go to your garden. Look, it doesn't have to be a physical garden. It could be. It doesn't have to have an oil press. A buddy of mine, his garden, his place, is there is a specific closet in his house that he goes to, he shuts the door, and his kids be wandering around like, anybody seen dad? Parents, you know the place. Don't lie. Y'all all have that place where you go to hide from your kids. But instead of eating like Doritos and Swiss rolls, how about you to spend time talking with your father in heaven? Uh, see the little fingers like under the door looking for you? Yeah. <laughs> You know exactly what I'm talking about. Don't, don't lie, don't lie. All right, so the second thing is this. Get this, and this is huge. Jesus wants you to be in our Father's will. Jesus wants you to be in our Father's will. Look, we said that night, we said the garden was a place of great communion. It was. And God had, that was his time with God, or Jesus, that was his time with God. But it was also a place of great suffering. We don't like that part. We don't like it. I get it. And, and, and I want to be very clear on what I'm saying here. I want to be very clear on what I'm saying and what I'm 100% confident that Jesus was saying, not just in this prayer, but through his ministry and through his teaching. Look, we don't have to wonder about what it means to be a Christian. It's not a team of people who are around a table and having this arbitrary discussion. No, he taught us exactly what it looks like. But oftentimes his teaching was hard, sometimes misunderstood. Sometimes it just seemed inflammatory. Like, look at this, what he says in Jesus, uh, what Jesus said in Matthew 16. He says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you try and give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Y'all, look, I've never seen somebody literally nailed on a cross, but they have. They knew exactly what he was saying with this. And this was a hard teaching. And oftentimes, look, we love Jesus. We love what he's saying. We're like, whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have eternal in your life. And you're like, I love that, Jesus. Heaven sounds amazing. Jesus is like, love your neighbor. And you're like, I love to love my neighbor. It's one of my favorite things to do. My neighbors are awesome. They're so cool, except for that one over there. And they smell. They're mean. I don't like the way they talk. But the rest of men, I love to love my neighbor. Like always that exception, right? He's like, I want everyone to be right where I am. And you're like, yeah, I love that. I want to be with Jesus. That sounds so cool. In the garden, I'm not so sure that works for me. Take up your cross and follow me. And you're like, Why is this so hard for us? Look, we think in the world but not of the world means that we don't hang around with a certain type of people. We're like the world has all of its indulgences. But I don't do them because I'm in the world but not 
of the world. We're like, the world may go out, they're going to party all night, they're going to drink, they're going to smoke, they're going to do drugs, they're going to have all these one-night stands, stuff like that, but not me, because I'm in the world, but not of the world. Like, we honestly think that's what it means. But when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, you're like, no, 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 no. Look, I... I'm not there yet. Like, I'm I'm getting there, but I'm not there yet. No, you're not there yet because you're not done being in the world. Look, some of you guys are so uncomfortable right now. That's okay. I'm going to move on, but I'm coming back. Okay. Uh, Martin Luther King said it like this. The end of life is not to be happy nor to achieve pleasure and avoid pain, but to do the will of God. Come what may. Look, in the world, we pursue what makes us happy. And even more than that, I really think what we do is we just do everything we can to avoid pain. That's what it means to be in the world. We either pursue what makes us happy or we pursue what we can, whatever we can to avoid pain. Don't believe me? So, all right, so I had this this experience. I don't know what to call it other than an experience when I was in high school, I was, I don't know, 14, 15, 16. We went on this camp trip. It was like a high adventure camp. And uh, there was this giant in the tree obstacle course. For those that don't know, I don't do heights. I don't like heights. But I'm also an adrenaline junkie. So like there's something about facing my fear that really like excites me. And at the end of this giant obstacle course, like way up there, and you're getting progressively higher, was this huge zip line. And I'm like, I'm doing that. Like, I didn't care how much I was scared. I didn't care how much, like, I I was going to face my fears. I was going to get myself up there. So I'm getting ready, and they strap you in this weird, tiny, uncomfortable harness they like, it has like a belt that goes around the waist and then a strap here and a strap here. And you're like, uh, what's this going to do? So you're climbing up this obstacle course and you got this little thing clipped to the harness and it's like clipped to this rope and this is your guide rope. So if you slip, you don't fall and die. Uh, paperwork's a nightmare. Uh, so I'm climbing up all of this little thing and I'm like weaving in and out of these rope nets. And finally, finally, I reached the coveted Zip line platform. Now, I scared the whole way, but I kept looking over there like, that's the prize. That's what we're going for. And I get to this platform, and it's literally 100 feet off the ground, and they like switch your cable around. You know, so you put on the new cable, and you take the old one off, and now I'm just attached to the zip line, and I'm standing at the edge of it looking down. 100 feet off the ground. Nobody know. Didn't like that. But I really wanted to do this zip line. So I'm like, like get myself together and I'm talking myself up. And finally I'm like, and I just step off. What they didn't tell me was it was about a 40 foot free fall before that harness kicked in. (laughs) Y'all, that was rough. Like, all of a sudden, it, like, yanks over here. Look, there are sensitive things down there. I was this close to not having any kids. <laughs> Look, and I don't know if the zip line was 50 feet. I don't know if it was a mile. Because all I could think about was the pain I was experiencing at that moment. When I get down to the end of the zip line, there is absolutely nothing in me that thinks, I should do that again. <laughs> No, every fiber of my being wanted to make sure that I never experienced that again. <laughs> Look, we might think that, you know, we want to pursue pleasures and, and our desires, but really what I want to do is I want to avoid that. <laughs> Look, Jesus was in the garden. He was talking to God. This is the place he experienced suffering. And he was praying that every single person that God had given him all of the believers would be right there. And we're like, I really, really want to avoid the whole suffering thing. Guess what? I do too. You know who else wanted to avoid it? Jesus. 
He was in the garden praying, God, if there's any way that you can take this cup from me, please do it. But if we look at this time in the garden and all we see is the suffering that Jesus went through, we are missing the big picture. Because Jesus in that moment was doing the thing that he wanted most, which was to be in his Father's will. That was his biggest priority. It is so important, so important as a Christian that we get this, that we have this mindset shift, that it's not about, it's not about doing what we want. It's not about avoiding what we don't want. It's about doing what he wants. God has, like James said, God has a specific will, plan, and purpose for your life. And doing that has to be our first priority. So, Pastor, does that mean that I should want to suffer? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that avoiding that suffering can no longer be our biggest driver in our life. We need to be driven by what God wants us to do. Well, how do we figure that out? Well, we already answered that, actually. By spending time in the presence of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is one of my favorite verses. It talks about being a living sacrifice. It talks about not being conformed by the world. But it goes on and says, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. That's what we talked about in that verse with Corinthians as well. That when you're seeing God, when you're pursuing God, it changes you into his glorious image. But it goes on here and say, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So being in the world, but not of the world, it's going to require a mindset shift. I almost wanted to be like, it means being in my father's will no matter what. I don't care how much it hurts. But that's not honest. It's not, it sounds good. It's just not honest. Look, see, I want to be in my Father's will more than anything. But you know what else I want? I also care about how much suffering I have to endure. I do. I don't get excited about that part. Someone comes up there and is like, one day you're going to be arrested for the things you're saying right now. I'm not out there going, yeah, let's go. No. Like you're going to be taken away from your family. You might never see them. Come on. No. Look, there are people in places like China that are arrested because of their faith. They're tortured. They literally have fingers cut off so that be trying to get them to tell them the names of other Christians and other people in there. You think they're waking up one morning and be like, I still got six fingers left. Let's see how many we can lose. No, it doesn't work that way. Look, but here's the thing. Even though they're going through that, they experience a joy that most of us will never know. James 1 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Look, it's not joy in the trial itself. It's joy in what the trial produces. It's that mindset shift. It's God wanting to shape me and my desires to line up with his desires. So what does it mean to be not in the world but, or not of the world but in the world? It means that we have to look, things, look at things differently. But you cannot be different from the world if your priorities are the same. All right, here's the thing. Even the world knows it, though. You cannot completely avoid all pain. It's going to be there. Look, we all have jobs we hate. I mean, James, I love this job. Please don't fire me. Um, we have relationship issues. We have priorities that we don't want to do. Like for me, can I be honest with you guys? I hate doing dishes. Absolutely hate it. Like bending over the sink, like washing these dishes, it makes my back hurt. I absolutely hate it. And you're like, you should get a dishwasher. Here's the thing. I have one. Okay? But I don't feel like the dishes get out of there clean unless I scrape off and wash every particle of food before they go in. We're talking soap, hot water, and a scrub brush. Otherwise, you're just recycling food water over them. The only thing I hate worse than doing the dishes is pulling a dirty dish out of a clean dishwasher. I hate it. 
If it were up to me, we would have nothing but plastic utensils, paper plates, even plastic serving utensils. And at the end of every meal, you just throw everything away. But the problem with that is that means that your trash is going to pile up and you're going to have to take that out all the time. And I hate that too. <laughs> it's a no win. Look, there are things in life that we don't want to do. There are things in life that we don't want to deal with and we still have to, whether it's as simple as procrastinating a chore or whether it's dealing with something heavy like a loss of a family member. How does the world cope with the pain? Distraction. They try to numb it away. I used to work at Old Chicago back in the day and we had a whole bunch of people came in there. Pretty much everybody that came through there that was looking to party, that was looking to get wasted, was really just trying to avoid something they were dealing with. Nobody knows how to deal with the hard things anymore. And when you don't deal with it long enough, you just, it just starts to build up, it starts to build up, and then you get really, really messed up. And you don't believe, and then what happens is then you, you just have a society full of super jacked up people. And if you don't believe me, pick up the phone and try to schedule an appointment with a the therapist. They're all on a six month wait. Christians be like, that's not me, pastor. I don't even drink. Yeah, but how many hours a day do you spend on Candy Crush? How many hours a day do you spend on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram? How many hours a week do you binge your favorite Netflix show? It's the same thing. We're just numbing. That's it. We're looking for a distraction. When things get hard, when things get uncomfortable, we turn ourselves to whatever we can do to numb it away. Which brings me to the last thing that Jesus wanted when he prayed that every believer be with him where he is. Jesus wants to be there with us. This is that missing piece that was so powerful and so amazing because here's the thing. We serve an awesome, amazing God that cares for us more than we can possibly understand. So with this whole thing, this whole thing that God showed me, like it, my focus was on me, like I'm being relocated over here. Like even with the garden, I've got this new way to see this. I've got this new way. Like my focus was on my shift, which is important I was focused on all the hard things that meant for me. Where it says that in this life you will have trials and you will have sorrows. And here's the thing, following him, not only does it not guarantee you will be prevented, like that's going to be prevented, it often means that you're going to have more of them. But he already knew this. He knew exactly what he was asking and exactly what comes with it. And this part, it's so simple, but it's so powerful because here's the thing. If he wants us to be there with him, when we experience these trials, when we experience these sorrows, these pains, these sufferings, guess what? That means he's already there with us, going through it with us. He loves us so much that he doesn't want us to go through this alone. And can I tell you something really important? It's the hard times that God wants to show up most in your life. Those are the times he wants to do something. Look, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, he wrote this super encouraging verse of the day. The day of death is better than the day of your birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. Awesome. Y'all are dismissed. That's a good note to end. No, like the day of death is better than the day of your birth. Like I think of the birth of my children. What an awesome day. The house of mourning is better than the house of feasting. Look, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night that he sweat blood, he said, I pray that every believer be here with me where I am. Talk about a house of mourning. So why? Why is a house of mourning better than a house of feasting? Because it's in these moments where God wants to show up most in our life. 
It's in these moments where we really need God, where he wants to do a miracle in our life. Look, Psalm says this, it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Why are we numbing ourselves out of the house of mourning? Don't we know that's where Jesus is? Look, like I said, out of the house of mourning, God wants to do a miracle in your life. Maybe it is a physical hearing, healing. Maybe it's a restoration, but you know what? What greater miracle than changing the heart of a person, whether it's yourself, a family member, somebody you've been praying for? Look, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're going through. He does. But wherever you are, if you're in that house of mourning, I want you to know you're not going through it alone. But I pray, 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 pray that you have this mindset shift it's not about what you're dealing with. It's about what God's going to do with you in that situation. It's about the way that God's going to meet you there. Look, believe it or not, I know this is a small example because it's not, some of you guys have gone through great loss in the past week, the past month, the past year. But can I tell you, in the last month without my voice, I was in a house of mourning. I was frustrated. I was angry. I was hurt. I literally had, I just prayed quietly, God, can you do something about this? But what changed is when I started asking or stopped asking that and started the question, God, what are you wanting to do in this? Can I pray for you? Father, I just want everybody, if you guys would, close your eyes, bow your heads. Father, I just pray that you meet every single person in this room, where they're at. Father, I pray if they're in the house of mourning, that they feel your presence there. They don't try to escape it by distractions. They don't try to escape it by things that sort of take their focus away, that they sit in that place and they cry out to you, Lord, I'm here. Father, I pray for every single person in this room. Father, I just pray they get it. I just pray that they really get it. That in this life, Father, than the trials and the sorrows and stuff like that, it's really, it's not about them. It's about what you want to do in them. It's about what you want to do in your kingdom using them. Your word says that you comfort us so that we can comfort other people, Father. Let them be the people here that reach out to those that are hurting in their own house of mourning and say, you're not alone. Look, if you're in here today and you say, that's me, you're saying, I'm in the house of mourning and I feel alone and I just need God to show up in my life. I wanna pray for you. Would you raise your hand? Nobody's looking around. It doesn't matter. I see hands going up all over the place. Father, be with every single person right here that raised their hand, Father. Send your spirit, your comforter. Meet them where they're at. Lift them up. It says you are close to the brokenhearted, Father. Father, I pray that you would put people in their life to speak life. Father, I would pray that you would show them new avenues to go closer and closer to you, Father. And I just pray, just pray that they in turn, through this experience, as you lead them not just through it, but out of it, Father, that you will help use them to in turn comfort others. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.